We're going to continue our uh, work, walk through James today and uh, be focusing on James 3, 13 to 18. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. Your jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart. Do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Dear Lord, open our hearts and our minds to your word and bless Tony in his presentation of that we will receive your good news for your glory. Amen. For reading that, Terry. Well, I have to say, it feels a little different today than the time I spoke last three years ago. A few things to note. Um, we're doing a few renovations in here. You can see the carpet looks nice. We've got new painting on the walls. We were over there when I was preaching three years ago. Um, and last time, Jared was on his sabbatical, and now this time, Jim is on his sabbatical. And Jim, I know you'll probably eventually listen to this. We are so thankful that you are resting with Jesus. I hope you're resting well. And I think probably the biggest thing I notice is I don't have a torn Achilles while I'm preaching. Uh, for those of you that didn't know, Three years ago, I tore my Achilles. I had not known it at the time. I just knew that it was painful and sore. And I was preaching the following Sunday and eventually found out later that it was torn and I need to have a procedure. But I bring that up because a torn Achilles feels a certain way when, I, when you walk as compared to an intact Achilles. For example, I had to go up the stairs the one step at a time, leading with my good leg, and I had no power to push down to plantar flex to go up with my torn side. Um, there was pain and swelling as compared to an intact Achilles. Um, and like I said, the strength wasn't there. I was walking a little bit differently. Um, one of the things, I'm a, for those of you that don't know, I'm a physical therapist, and one of the tests that we have to identify a torn Achilles is called the Thompson test, and what you do is you have the person lay on their stomach, and you go up to them, and you squeeze their calf. Now, this is a diagnostic assessment. What you would expect in an intact Achilles is for that foot to plantar flex a little bit to, to push down when you squeeze the calf. When they did it to me and they squeezed my calf, my foot didn't move. Therefore, the Achilles is not intact, not pulling on the foot. What we see James doing here in this passage is providing us a diagnostic on what is wisdom from above and what is wisdom from below. The same way that I felt different we could observe things um, because of what was going on the inside. On the outside, we could see I was limping, I had swelling, I had bruising. These were outside things pointing to what was going on on the inside of me. The same way James is saying, we can see things on the outside that point to what's going on in the inside. So if you wouldn't mind pulling up the scripture again, I'd like to read through it one more time. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is, is, not, this is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, 
unspiritual, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is shown in peace by those who make peace. And I'd like to talk, I have, I have three kind of sections today that I'm going to talk about. And the first one is, who is wise? He starts off asking, who is wise among you? If you wouldn't mind keeping that up, um, the slide up. And the second one that I want to talk about is earthly wisdom. What does that look like? Uh, what can we see with that? And then the last one will be the wisdom from above. So let's start out. Uh, James, James flat out asks, who is wise among you? And says, by his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. And I want to point out a few things. He says, show his works. We heard from Daniel two weeks ago, and it talked a lot about this faith producing good fruit. He talked about being a tree and producing good fruit. And James is just saying, well, show me. Show me, show me that you're wise. Well, how do we know what is wise and what we're supposed to be showing? And I know that there are people in here that have studied Greek. I have not, so forgive me because I have a hard enough time with words in English, let alone Greek. So, the word that James uses for good is kalos, which means beautiful by reason of purity of heart and life. So this goodness is not the dry, rigid, rule-following goodness. This goodness is meant to be beautiful by reason of purity and heart. This is a, 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 a beautiful good. And conduct, it, the word he uses is honesterfe, which is a way of being or an entire way of life. So what James is pointing to is not that a person is good here, uh, there, does a good deed um, once in a while. He's talking about the way that a person is living their life can be observed in beautiful goodness. So I, what, I, what I like is what he's saying is it's wisdom is not necessarily what you know. What he's saying is that uh, someone is wise when they are, their manner of life and behavior is beautifully good. And th I've heard it pointed as someone who's living wisely is living godliness applied. So what we learn from Jesus, we're applying that to life and we're seeing that lived out. This, this is a theme that you'll be noticing in James is what are we doing in pursuing Jesus? How are we living our life? What does that, how does that shape us? So what he's saying is, oh, one side note, the meekness of wisdom um, points back to Marcus talked last week about how the tongue is very powerful. And one of the images that was used is this powerful horse that's controlled by a bridle. Um, when you think of the me living in the meekness of wisdom, is going to be an individual who has power, has authority, but it's controlled. And who's controlling it? James would say that God and Jesus is controlling that. So you're going to see that reservation of power, that controlled manner of power, not just a horse that is not controlled. So, so we have who is wise among you? Someone whose manner of life and behavior is beautifully good. Now he's saying that we can live our lives according to wisdom from below, earthly wisdom, or we can live our lives from wisdom from above. So what does it look like when we're living according to earthly wisdom or wisdom from below? So this is not wisdom that comes down from above, he says. This is earthly, unspiritual, demonic, where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. And James is pointing at our hearts, where bitter and selfish ambition are. And this is not something new. 
If I can point to this panel right here, this has been going on since the fall. We see in Genesis 4, Cain becomes jealous of Abel, and what happens? Cain kills his brother. Um, but we also see this, this um, and, and so in, in jealousy, he kills his brother. In, for selfish ambition, what, what James is talking about, he's actually talking about um, office, positions of office. So how can I get to this position to get what I want to get? What can serve me? How can I, if I scratch your back, you scratch my back. How can I live my life to get what I want? And specifically, and here he's talking about position of office, but I think that it applies to the human heart and condition. It, it's even saturated in our culture. And so the example is the children's story of Lion King. We have Scar, right? So what does Scar want? Scar wants to be king of the pride lands. So what does he do? He plots. He makes a plan to kill his brother. He attempts to kill his nephew to get into that position office. He forms alliances with the hyenas. And what is the result of that? He becomes king for a moment. And through the gluttony of the hyenas, they turn the pride lands into a barren wasteland. This result, what James is pointing to, this condition of our heart, this bitter jealousy, this selfish ambition, what does it result? What does it result to? It results into disorder and every vile practice. So at this point, you're probably sitting there saying, well, Tony, I have no plans to murder my brother or become a king and, and murder and scheme and form alliances. So how does this really apply to me? So I'm going to tell you a story from a couple weeks back in my own life of how this applies. And I got permission from Sarah to share. So we were driving, Sarah and I were driving home in our car and Sarah was talking about a situation that she was dealing with and how she wanted to handle it and she had this idea. And I was listening to her and I started thinking, yeah, that idea sounds kind of familiar. It's something like I was talking about a couple months ago. So mid-sentence, I look at Sarah and I go, well, didn't I come up with that idea? That was my idea. And what, hap what happened? So, so selfish, I want the credit. I want her to know that that was a good idea and that was my idea. And what does that do? Immediately, Sarah feels unheard. She feels unseen. It disrupts. There's this disorder in our relationship. And that's just on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And so what James is saying is that this selfish ambition, this bitter jealousy that is in our hearts because of the fallen condition will lead to disorder amongst us and every vile practice. And so what, what's the alternative? What's the opposite? So what is wisdom from above? But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And the harvest of righteousness is sown by peace by those who make peace. Now this should sound familiar. Before Jim went on sabbatical, he preached through the Sermon on the Mount. And one of the main things in the Sermon on the Mount is that Jesus cares about what's going on in here and wants to change it. He wants to change us from the inside out so that these things can be evident in our life. And so what I want to do in this section is just point to Jesus on each of these things. So when Jesus talks about purity in Matthew 5, Jesus, from the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Blessed are the pure of heart, for they will see God. On peaceable... In, uh, in, again, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5. So if you're offering your gift at the altar, and then remember that your brother has something against you, so there's disruption, leave your gift before the altar, and go first reconcile to your brother, and then come offer your gift. Create peace between one another. As far as gentleness, in Matthew 20, when talking to the disciples, Jesus talks about rulers in the Gentiles, that they will rule over them. 
But he looks at the disciples and he says, but whoever would be great among you, first you must be a servant. And we see this, this gentleness of Jesus when he's dying on the cross and he has all his accusers around him and he looks at them and he says, Father, forgive them. He's not trying to um, attack them or defend himself. He says, Father, they don't know what they're doing. Forgive the people who are crucifying me. In openness to reason, this was a tough one. When I was <laughs> open to reason, finding uh, interactions with Jesus, uh, having a conversation, in Mark 12, there's a discussion between Jesus and a scribe, and the scribe's asking him, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, to love your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And uh, love your neighbor as yourself. And the scribe comes back and he says, you're right that loving your neighbor is more important than any of the offerings that, that we can have. And Jesus looks at the scribe and says, you are not far from God. He, he commends the reason that this scribe, this conversation that, have, that they're having. Full of mercy. In Matthew 18, we have the parable of the unforgiving servant where the servant uh, is indebted to his master, the master forgives him, and then that servant who was forgiven goes to somebody who owes him money and says, hey, I need you to pay me this money. And then when the master hears about this, he says, well, you weren't forgiving the way I forgave you. Jesus doubled downs on this in Luke 6, where he says, be merciful as your father is merciful. Full of fruit. We have another parable in Luke where Jesus talks about the importance of a tree producing good fruit. This, like I said, this, this James has an overarching theme and really should be read as a whole sermon, a whole piece, so I encourage you to do this, but point back to Daniel there and again, um, talking about we are rooted in Christ and so we produce good fruit. And Jesus says that's important. And why is it important? In Matthew 5, he says, let your light shine before others. Why? so that they may see your good deeds. Why? Is it so that I can get recognition? I can be right? I can have the good idea? No. It is so that, and it is so that they glorify your Father in heaven. The attention's not on me, it's on God. Impartial. Got a few examples here, and this again ties in directly with Dennis was saying. James has a theme. Um, they talk about partiality in the church. Don't treat the rich different than the poor. Um, as far as James, what what is Jesus doing? So in John four, we have Jesus engaging the Samaritan woman, and despite the cultural enmity between Jews and Samaritans, he treats her with respect. Not only is it some, a Samaritan, but it is a Samaritan woman. So you have Jesus treating the Samaritan woman with respect at the well. In Matthew 8, we have Jesus healing the centurion servant, who is a Gentile. He's not a part of the Jewish community. community. He's a part of the Roman government who is oppressing the Jews. And Jesus heals the centurion. He doesn't, he's not partial to only the Jews. He's healing the centurion servant. In Luke 10, again, we have the parable of the good Samaritan. What is he doing? He's lifting up to show someone who the Jews had an, a cultural enmity between. He's lifting them up as the hero. This is the person that did the right thing in this situation. And in Mark 10, he welcomes the children to his lap and puts them up and says, um, and, and lifts them up in a culture that wouldn't value what a child, child has to say. And sincere. In John 11, we have Jesus weeping at the tomb of Lazarus. In Matthew 6, he cries out to God and asking God to take the cup from him. And in Matthew 6, in the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about praying in sincerity, not for people to hear you, not for your own status and looking good, but to pray in sincerity on your own. So what does the life and teaching of Jesus lead to? 
Well, James would say it leads to righteousness and peace. And I'm going to be the first to admit, when I look at this list, I am intimidated. I will never accomplish all of that every day in my life. But Jesus did. And this is why I need him. So we'll do a little recap here. Wisdom is not what you know. It's how you live your life. How are you going through your life? Earthly wisdom is caused by bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. It's a heart condition. And what does that lead to? That leads to disorder and disrupted relationships and every vile practice. In contrast, wisdom from above comes from allowing Jesus to change us, our hearts, inside, inside out. And that's going to lead to peace and righteousness in our communities. So what's the takeaway? How do we allow Jesus, how do I allow Jesus to change my heart? How do you allow Jesus to change your heart? There's this book that I recently, I'm going to say listen to because I listen to audiobooks, I don't read books. Um, Practicing the Presence by Brother Lawrence. It's a really good bro- book, a little bit harder English. I hear they're updating it. So if you get the opportunity to engage it, it's a very, very uh, uh, good resource. Um, but what he would argue, what, he, what Brother Lawrence would argue is he would say, the simplest thing is during my day, How many times can I look at Jesus? How many times can I see what's around me and say, there's Jesus? That's what God is doing. And when I'm off, when when I'm in, uh, when I'm engaging into that selfish ambition or bitter jealousy, how can I turn and focus my attention on Jesus? The importance is to reflect on, in that practice, reflecting on Jesus' goodness, Jesus' grace, Jesus' mercy, and Jesus' love. He is gentle. Jesus is open to reason. Jesus is full of mercy. Jesus is sincere. And what he will do is he will show you where your heart's at, and he will help you diagnose your words, your actions, are those words and actions leading to disorder or are they leading to peace? Are those words and actions leading to every vile practice or are they leading to righteousness? And he will bring your attention to himself so that you can't focus on where you are at, which will in turn guide you into living a little bit more like him. Let me pray for us. Jesus, we are so thankful for your peace and your gentleness with our own life, with our neighbor's life. We are so thankful that you lived the life that you did and you gave us the teachings that you gave us and that you care about not what we do or, or, or how these, these, these actions that we fall into when we're living into the bitter jealousy and living into the selfish ambition. We are thankful that you love us so much that you died for us and that you came and said, you are mine. Please let us look at you. Give us the strength to to sit down and just spend time and rest in you so that we may be shaped by you. Amen.